Okay, some of the objectives. We've already talked about the first one here, protecting, storing native soils and vegetation, really the centerpiece and most critical part of low impact development where possible. Reducing the development envelope, that's the whole enchilada. That's the homes or the businesses, the roads, the parking. How do you reduce that development envelope intelligently so that you can conserve uh, those uh, native soils and vegetation. Another one I want to point out here, integrate stormwater controls into the design and create a multifunctional landscape. And the whole idea here is we're integrating the stormwater controls into the, into the design of the project. They are a, an aesthetic amenity as well as a stormwater management uh, practice. There are challenges. This is one of the real advantages to low impact development is we can use these practices for dual purpose, aesthetic amenity as well uh, as an engineered stormwater management control. A quick note that we're going to focus on perennial pavement today, but of course there's all these other practices that uh, are in the low impact development toolbox, bioretention, that's really the, the centerpieces and primary practice for low impact development, uh, vegetated roofs, that's the um, old WAMU, Washington Mutual building in Seattle, I'm not sure what it is now, is it Chase? Uh, rainwater collection, that's a project from B Bellingham. Uh, one that I have to say a lot of people are not familiar with, and that's the Lone Pack Pin Foundations. Actually, that system that you see right there is a project on Bainbridge Island, and that system was invented by uh, a colleague in Gig Harbor, local product. Let's get into some perennial pavement basics. Actually, this is a drawing out of the Eastern Washington Low Impact Development Manual, and don't you don't need to pay a lot of attention to the, the different specifications there or guidelines. It's just that giving you a sense of uh, the section or the components, the overall the components of a, a perennial pavement system. And of course there's a wearing course, the, the pavement, sometimes a uh, leveling or choker course, the aggregate storage or uh, reservoir or base material. This is a critical piece as far as the structural support for the flexible systems which all of the systems we're going to talk about today are flexible except for concrete. So the design of that aggregate base is critical in proper design for these systems. There may be some geosynthetics involved. We're going to talk a lot about that. There's a lot of nuance around that, often overused, under, but more importantly, elevated drains. And then, of course, the native underlying soils. We're going to talk a lot about that. I hope you already have a sense that a perennial pavement system is just a really big infiltration device. It's a big distributed infiltration facility. How you deal with the subgrade is critical. You may be designing and building on slopes, so there may be subsurface berms uh, in these systems. So let's talk about sort of the, the basic classes of perennial pavement. Porous asphalt, this is a flexible system. Uh, interesting picture here, uh, uh, you can see uh, this is the uh, a perennial pavement research installation that uh, I was a lead scientist on this project and uh, you can see the impervious asphalt next to the porous asphalt. Similar to conventional asphalt but very much reduced or eliminated finer material in the uh, aggregate blend. Typically used for lighter applications. Parking lots, we see a lot of it going down in parking lots. We're going to look at a, uh, one of those today. Uh, residential collector roads, driveways, uh, that's typical, although there has been uh, the use of porous asphalt for heavier application and most notably a highway in Arizona. And Mark Palmer will show you some uh, pictures of that installation. Typically 16% voids. You can see there for conventional, it's quite low. And industry engagement in this region has been fairly limited, uh, but it's increasing. We're starting to see more interest from the industry and more interest from local jurisdictions and designers on dialing in the specification for uh, porous asphalt. I want to let you know that we have a number of really poor porous asphalt installations in this region. I mean, they're almost become, they're almost gravel <laughs> parking lots. And there is a reason for that, in that we, uh, for years, were way off the mark as far as specifications for uh, porous asphalt. And we're getting much better. We've got a ways to go. But we're, we're, we're much better with our, um, our uh, design specification for porous asphalt now. Uh, primarily, we're using the wrong uh, binders at the wrong rate. Uh, much too far too low a grade a binder and that's why you see some of these systems out there unraveling I mean basically they're just turning into gravel pervious concrete so I should mention right now we've tried to standardize the language in the region this is what we've come up with and where we stand permeable pavement the overall term permeable pavement porous asphalt pervious concrete 
permeable pavers, and then the grid lattice system. Uh, this is really the industry saying, no, that's, this is what we call our stuff. You know, the concrete people, we call it pervious concrete. And so we've tried to um, uh, adopt those, those terms from, from the industry. So pervious concrete are one rigid system, and that makes a difference, particularly in your base aggregate. Generally, and we're gonna look at some samples, quarter to five inch round or crushed aggregate, Portland cement, and admixtures, uh, optional, it says optional here, but they're often used. In, in a pervious concrete installation uh, to increase workability and strength. 15 to 20 percent voids typical. This is a really important number here. We'll talk more about this. Voids are directly proportional to strength and so you have to be careful about your, the design here and the uh, void ratio. Uh, good experience in industry engagement in Western Washington. We have a very engaged pervious concrete industry here. A lot of benefits that come with that. This is an installation from Western Seattle in uh, High Point, and it's uh, actually a residential collector road uh, on a slope. It has some of those subsurface berms we talked about. We'll talk more about that. But this one, this is a great project, and it's the pavement is actually hydrologically connected to hydraulically connected to the bioretention next to it. So those two systems are working together. Uh, very cool project. Um, and uh, if you haven't been out to High Point, there's a lot of great projects to look at out there. Perennial pavers. Rick Crooks will be talking about this. Another flexible system, capable of uh, high vehicle loads. We have installations in industrial locations, other parts of the country. So high density concrete that interlock to transfer loads to the surrounding pavers. 12% voids typical, although that really ranges more and more like 12 to up to 15, 17, yeah, in that range. A good experience in industry engagement in this region. You have a lot of, re so what I should explain, when I say this and why I even mention it, is because th this these are the people you need to, to talk to when you are thinking about installing these systems. These are your great resources for you to go to. And when we have good industry engagement, that means you have support systems out there to, and, and people to talk to about details. Uh, interesting project from Marysville. This is a, a park and ride. What's really interesting, this is one of the first larger scale perennial pavement installations in Western Washington. And what's interesting about this system is that it has a water quality treatment layer built into it. What's really interesting about that is that there's this layer of sand includes organic material, peat. So do we have any road engineers here? Do we have any people that design roads? You can raise your hands. Okay, how do you feel about organic material in your road section? I'm getting a, like a lot of like, are you crazy? <laughs> At any rate, uh, this project has worked beautifully. Uh, it's uh, saved the uh, about $300,000 uh, on a $3 million project because they were able to treat the water in the section. Uh, the secret here is they used a very low, very little organic material and a very refractive, very stable organic material. So there are different ways of doing it. The key here is if you need to, designing and water quality treatment, there are ways to do it. This is new thinking. How do we do it appropriately so that it maintains uh, structural integrity? The plastic grid systems, Flexible, very high percent voids. You really have to work to plug this stuff up. It infiltrates quite rapidly. Plastic grids, uh, there are concrete, there are other materials, concrete grids, old hasting blocks have been around forever and ever, uh, but we're gonna focus primarily on the plastic grid systems. Uh, and they're either filled with gravel or soil or a media planted with grass, uh, capable of high vehicle loads, uh, used at lower speeds. Good industry engagement in this region too. Picture from back to High Point again. This is a invisible structure gravel paved system. This is a impervious asphalt travelway with par uh, the parking stalls uh, using a grass paved system. They actually had to replace some of these, and the grass paved systems have uh, worked beautifully in the right application. They do not work beautifully <laughs> in the wrong application, like most anything. You have to be uh, careful of where to put these, how to put them down. So uh, just a little bit on a couple of the basics on how these facilities work. Storage and infiltrations. Basically, of course, there's a, a, a permeable pavement system and water then infiltrates through that uh, perennial pavement into an aggregate base. The aggregate base acts as structural support, and we're gonna talk about the, the detail, the nuance of that, and there is nuance to how you build a structural base that is also a water storage facility, okay? 
so the thickness of that aggregate base is going to depend on your, on your soils, it's going to depend on the pavement system, and it's going to depend on uh, the hydrologic uh, needs or the storage capability of that system. Of course, water moves then into the, unless you have really horrible subgrade soils, uh, moves into that, uh, in infiltrates into that subgrade soil. Uh, there may be a geosynthetic, either a geogrid or uh, geotextile. Often that is overused. Generally, you do not need geotextile on the bottom of these systems to separate the aggregate base from your subgrade. You may need it for structural stability. And it may be uh, often the case that you use it on the sides of the facility uh, to prevent uh, movement of material uh, off the sides and into that aggregate base. But as far as material moving from the subgrade up into your aggregate base, that is generally not a concern. Much more of a concern is do we need some sort of material for st structural stability? You should always build in some sort of overflow system. And we'll look at a lot of different examples. And here's a good one here, a really uh, you know, easy to do, interesting overflow system. In that system, for example, if part of the parking area was clogged up, water can move, in this case, to this aggregate strip in the, in the parking median and is hydrologically or hydraulically connected to the aggregate base. So that's just one example of how you build up surface, uh, build a surface overflow backup system. And there are lots of different ways of doing it. This is just one example. Uh, but you're always thinking about that in uh, the design of these systems. Slopes. Slopes have some really interesting considerations. Picture from Bellingham that Chris designed, and it incorporates a number of different design elements, but I really want to point out here subsurface berms. This is really a very good way to design on slopes to make sure your water is, one, you're, you're uh, designing for maximum infiltration capability, but also, of course, reducing the velocities of that water underneath the pavement system, preventing erosion. We have good experience with this. Previous concrete installation that we looked at at High Point also has the subsurface berms with a, a, a geosynthetic. So this is a place where geosynthetic would be appropriate. And again, we're not so much concerned about material moving up into the aggregate base as erosion along the base. What are some of the applications, kind of looking overall at the different applications of perennial pavement systems? Low volume residential roads, parking, very typical, public walkways, parks, plazas, patios. Uh, out of this list, what do you think was the first use of a permeable pavement-like material? Walls, yeah, England. <laughs>